The SS Nomadic, tender ship to the ill-fated Titanic, is the last remaining White Star Line vessel in the world. Fitted with but two lifeboats, they left Belfast in 1911 to start a career taking passengers out to meet the most luxurious ships in the world. They would remain together before finally being separated in 1974. From there, both vessels took a path that would see them threatened with complete destruction. The lifeboat now saved, we will be following the journey it made and how it was saved from the mists of time. Welcome to the Nomadic Lifeboats. Nomadic, under the name Enugenier Menard, tenders the RMS Queen Elizabeth for the final time on November 4th, 1968, officially ending her career as a tender. After her long and eventful life serving the most luxurious ships in the world and surviving two world wars, she is laid up in Cherbourg, waiting to be sold. There she sits through the winter until a demolition company named Sumeriac buys the ship and arranges for her to be towed from Cherbourg to the port of Le Havre on April 26, 1969. Nomadic bids farewell to her home of some 57 years and makes for her curtain call. After arriving in Le Havre, she is tied up on the quayside and like her own green mile, she sits there waiting for her absolution. However, before anything could happen to her, a French businessman named Roland Spinnywin comes forward and buys Nomadic from Sumeriac. At this point, Nomadic, albeit likely looking a little bit grubby, is still complete. Lifeboats, funnel, masts, all are accounted for. But this is not to last. Roland decides to take Nomadic inland along the River Seine to a place called Conflans saint tihonorin a commune considered to be the capital of the French inland waterways. From there, he takes her a short way up the River Oaza to her new moorings. Over the next three and a half years, basic work begins. Roland had her mast, funnel and enclosed bridge removed, but aside from that, she had sat there slowly collecting dust and decay. During this time, she had no security and sadly was ransacked, having lots of her brass and copper fittings stolen. Among other practical items, the ship's bell was also taken. Finally, in 1973, she loses her engines as they are removed from the ship. For the first time in 62 years, Nomadic has lost the ability to steam under her own power. In 1974, another entrepreneur called Yvonne Vincent comes to the Nomadic's assistance and buys her from Roland Spinnywin. Even though Roland hasn't been a particularly good owner for Nomadic, he must be recognised for if it wasn't for his intervention in 69, she'd be long gone by now. Yvonne Vincent has the dream, the motivation, but most of all the funds to transform Nomadic into a floating restaurant. At this point, still named Enigenier Menard, Yvonne officially restores her name back to Nomadic. Also, more notably, her lifeboats are still on board. From this point, there's a distinct lack of documentation in regards to specifically what happened, but speaking with Europe's leading authority and historian on Nomadic, Philip Delanoy, it is known as fact that Nomadic's flying deck remained even after arriving in Paris. As for her lifeboats, it is understood that they remained on board during this final leg of the journey. Yvonne was very patient and waited for the Seine to be at its lowest level. He then flooded 800 tons of water into the Nomadic, sinking her 1.6 feet deeper into the water. All of this was to make sure that she could pass under the low bridges that stood between her and reaching her new moorings in Paris. In October of 1974, the Nomadic finally completes the journey. Berthing at Quai d'Ebly, across from the Eiffel Tower, work begins right away to convert her into a floating restaurant. And so our heroes say goodbye. With Nomadic berthed, her lifeboats are lowered onto the quayside. For the first time, they are now separated from the Nomadic. At this point, Nomadic is undergoing major modifications, turning her into a lavish floating restaurant. But sadly for the lifeboats, they are pushed aside and stowed against a wall. Exposed to the elements and with no maintenance or protection, it is here they will sit for another 13 years. Over time, souvenir hunters come along, taking pieces from the boats such as their nameplates, but nothing is done about it. They really do just sit there for 13 years, their condition slowly but surely deteriorating. 
It's a little shocking that no one acknowledged their significance. Together, they represented some of the few remaining lifeboats of the White Star Line. This is where a man called Jean-Charles Arnault comes into the picture. Born in Cherbourg in 1910, Jean grew up to have a long life in all things nautical, from sailing on oil tankers in the 1930s to becoming Commodore of the Shell UK fleet in the 1950s. He was somewhat of a hero to France for his role in avoiding a major economic crisis by maintaining oil supplies to the country during the Suez Crisis of 1956. Retiring to Tourleville in 1971, Jean's passion for all things nautical didn't leave him, and with his newfound free time, plans started to stir in his mind. When the Nazis came to France in 1940, they burnt down Cherbourg's Maritime Museum, destroying artifacts and models dating back to 1828. Some items were saved moments before the Nazis' arrival, but since this time, Cherbourg became one of the only major ports in France to not have a Maritime Museum. Jean wanted to change this, and quoted in an interview for a French magazine in 2002, he said, Where is the history of local shipbuilding? Everywhere in France but here. The National Museum has gradually distributed to the various maritime museums in the province the collection of Cherbourg, because we no longer have a venue. It is for this reason that I wanted to do my best to fill a void. Sean made the decision to open a maritime museum called Le Musée Maritime Chanteline. He had a vision of exhibiting four different aspects of things nautical, shipping, fishing, war and marina. It was in 1985 that he was granted a small bunker and a building complex and with the help of volunteers, they renovated the site. Using his private collection of artifacts, the museum was born. Open to the public in 1987, Jean didn't stop there. He continued to find more artifacts to showcase, and this is how he came to acquire Nomadic's lifeboats. It was in 1987 that Jean approached Yvonne Vincent, the owner of the Nomadic, and a deal was made to loan Jean the lifeboats. Yvonne was more than happy to see them go, as he already had his plate full with Nomadic. Jean made arrangements, and both the boats were transported to the museum. They were in very bad condition and in urgent need of restoration. This was something Jean really wanted to do, but he had the attitude of gathering lots of projects at the same time, then one by one to restore them. But sadly for the lifeboats, he never got time to do so. The lifeboats sat outside the museum just as they had alongside Nomadic exposed and unprotected. Regrettably, as the years rolled by, the boats sank more and more inside themselves, their structural stability breaking down. Lifeboat 1 was sadly the first to pay the ultimate price. The deterioration and decay was so advanced, she was nothing but rotted wood on the floor. It's unclear who made the decision, but she was burned and disposed of. Little is spoken about Lifeboat 1, however in 2002, Sean reflects on Boat 2. The boat is now in poor condition, but there is still time to save her. It is still better there than abandoned on the banks of the Seine. This is where I recovered them from the owner of Nomadic, with a lease for 300 years. You see, I think of my successors, but it still cost me transport. As of 2002, this puts the lifeboat's time unprotected and exposed at some 35 years. It's also around this time that things with Nomadic are getting worse by the day. She has been closed, riddled of unpaid debt, and after being repossessed, she is to be removed from Paris. It wasn't until 2007 that the Nomadic Preservation Society was finally able to purchase the lifeboats. Le Musée Maritime Chanteline was in a very bad position. Jean-Charles Arnault, who was the heart and soul of the museum at this point, was 96 years old and his health was getting worse. The museum wasn't making much money, had growing debts, and the council had told them they were to be evicted from the building. It was July of 2007 they began their own SOS to save the museum. The lifeboat was on its last legs, so it was a win-win. The museum gets some funds and offloads a restoration project it could never afford. The dawn of a new day. Now officially in ownership, planning goes full steam ahead to bring the lifeboat back to Belfast. As of 2007, the boat has been unprotected for a staggering 38 years. 
David Lawrence, the then project manager for Lifeboat 2, spoke about her condition at the time before being removed from the museum, saying, This lifeboat would roughly be in normal height around three and a half feet off the ground. When I found her, she was just 18 inches. Almost completely crushed. All the ribs inside were completely snapped. It was split virtually in two. The bottom part of the planking had completely disappeared. So if you stepped into the middle of the boat, you would be touching the ground and not any words. None of the seats around the edge existed. It was literally a complete mess. Now to move the lifeboat, it was decided they would construct a metal cradle over it to give support. The boat was then attached to the cradle and placed onto a low loader. After all these years, she is finally getting the help she'd been crying out for. Leaving France for the final time, the lifeboat makes its grand return to Northern Ireland, firstly being stored at Harland & Wolf, her original builders, before later being taken to Petit Crew Marine at Strangford Loch, awaiting preservation and restoration. The cradle built for support really helped save her. Over five years, the boat hung from the cradle and slowly returned back to its original shape. This was a slow process as the timbers were very stressed and any attempt to force to it in any direction would have resulted in damage. During this time, funds were being raised to preserve and restore the boat and a grant was applied for from the Heritage Lottery Fund. During this time, extensive research was being done to make sure the lifeboat was restored authentically but also to document her. Many replica lifeboats have been made over the years for films and museums but for the first time, we had the opportunity to get specific dimensions, sizes and methods of construction from an authentic boat. It's with thanks to the Nomadic Preservation Society, the world now has a perfect template to create 100% accurate reproductions. It is from this research that Nomadic will in the future receive two brand new perfect replica lifeboats. With her shape restored, work started on fixing her up, replacing missing timbers and refabricating completely missing parts. One of the stipulations from the Heritage Lottery Fund was that they had to restore her with original materials and precisely that has happened. A conscious decision was made that no modern touches would be added. Sadly, not all of the boat could be saved. Most notably was the keel. This is the spine of the boat and in essence holds everything together. Looking at her hung in the cradle, you could clearly see she is nearly split in half with her side coming detached. Speaking once again with David Lawrence, he explained it was too damaged and too far gone to save. It was actually split into three pieces. Using original materials, a new keel had to be crafted and put in place. But what was to happen to the original keel? David continued saying, there were two things people were talking about doing at the time. One was a suggestion to cut the keel plate up and sell it in small pieces. I don't see the point in that, for me it's a historical object, even if it's just the keel. So I said, let's put it onto a brace, we'll have the lifeboat there and the original keel plate alongside so people can see the original keel plate. It would be another added artifact to go with the lifeboat. And so with her new keel in place, work could begin to fix up the timbers. The lifeboat is clinker built, meaning it's constructed with a wooden hull of planks that overlap each other. As said earlier, most of the bottom of the boat was missing, as well as holes along the hull. The new timbers were to be crafted, again using original materials, and slowly, bit by bit, the boat became whole again. At this point, the lifeboat is already looking years younger. The next step is to treat and paint the wood. And so, 102 years after leaving Belfast, 39 plus years of neglect and following 6 years of restoration, the lifeboat is now fully conserved. Funds will still be needed to guarantee she continues to receive treatments and preventing her wood from deteriorating once again. But for now, she is saved. The Nomadic Lifeboat is only one of two known surviving White Star Line lifeboats, the other having come from the Oceanic. But with the Nomadic Lifeboat, she's truly one of a kind. Built by Harland and Wolfe, designed by Chief Draftsman Roderick Chisholm, who would lose his life on the Titanic as a member of the Guarantee Group, coming from Nomadic, designed originally to serve the Olympic class liners, this boat is steeped in very rich history. The world came so very close to losing this link. 
My thanks go out to Philip Delanoy, David Lawrence, the Nomadic Preservation Society, everyone involved who had a part to play in the saviour of this lifeboat. Thanks to your actions and foresight that a future generation has this real link to history. <laughs>